afternoon. Good afternoon. Again. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. I call now on our director of bands, chair of our department, and now director of our new music program to begin in the fall, Mr. Warren L. Duncan. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I just want to take a very brief opportunity to uh, come right on in. Yeah, come on in to welcome all of you here uh, at our 24th William L. Dawson Lecture. Uh, I'm looking forward to it again as usual. Uh, and this is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, our 24th lecture. We haven't had anybody repeat, have we? Well, I, seems like that's it, you know, number 24. Dr. Baxil, I'm looking forward to what you have to bring for us today, and uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Having said that, uh, welcome again, and hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, we'll call upon Dr. Barr again to come back and, and make the introduction of our speaker. Dr. Barr, here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our 2015 William Levi Dawson lecturer, Dr. Horace J. Maxiel, Jr. Dr. Maxiel currently serves on the faculty of Baylor University. He is a graduate of Louisiana Tech University, Southeastern Louisiana University, and Louisiana State University, where he earned the PhD in musicology. He has published papers on music theory and analysis, jazz, and I think I saw one on the involvement of black musicians in major research organizations. Uh, among his former positions is that of Associate Director of Research at the Center for Black Music R Research in Chicago, which is one of the foremost institutions in the world for information and records pertaining to black music and musicians. Dr. Maxiel is a saxophonist, and it is through a jazz concert presented at Jackson State University, as we were discussing yesterday, uh, presented by some of the leading jazz musicians that he was drawn to pursue music as a career. His biography mentions that one of his research interests is musical semiotics. Semiotics, as broadly defined by Merriam-Webster, is the philosophical theory of signs and symbols as pertaining to their function in languages, and in this case, the language of music. Today's lecture will point us to familiar aspects in what may otherwise be unfamiliar music. We will learn to listen with new ears. Dr. Maxiel, it has been a pleasure getting to know you these last two days. I look forward to your presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Horace J. Axel Jr. I'm officially scared now. Uh, my grandmother always told me that when people are nice to you, you ought to say thank you. So. I definitely want to thank the organizers of this event, first and foremost, and specifically uh, Dr. Barr for being such a warm and gracious host to me since I've been here. I'll jump right in. When I was growing up on Fridays were special days at my grandmother's house. Once family members left work and school for the day, we all gathered at grandmother's house for dinner. As we ate generous helpings of fried fish, collard greens, cornbread, potato salad, the family laughed and enjoyed each other's company over dessert, which was one, often one of my grandmother's signature pound cakes. We would sit in the den and continue lighthearted fellowship through the evening. Television shows that we watched after dinner was the Friday night after seven routine on CBS. That would have been the Dukes of Hazard followed by Dallas, then followed by 
found in Christ. My family's musical traditions invoke even richer memories. As a child, I remember my grandfather quietly leaving the den and the lively conversations to retreat to the living room. He would sit at the piano and begin to play and sing spiritual songs. In my youthful ignorance, I chuckled at his inaudible moans and my inability to comprehend what he was actually saying or even playing. My grandfather was in his own world, expressing musical sentiments in his own way. After growing a little older and becoming a novice musician in the high school band, I actually noticed that my grandfather sang out of tune. And he created variations on some of the songs, and I really only remember him playing one. Yet I continued to listen to him play, and then in my own quiet time, began to mimic the sounds he made on the piano. Now, when the family gathers for Christmas, I help provide music for the occasion. Other family members bring instruments and we perform carols, blues, and gospel songs. Sometimes members of my family ask me to play like Grandpa. When I do so, everyone in the room kind of marvels at how much attention I actually pay to his performances, even though they were supposed to be private. And even at these occasions, when everyone else is eating, my grandfather would slip away discreetly into a room so that he could play his tunes in his own way. Never would I have imagined that his intimate expressions and seeming out of tune vocal inflections would so affect my musical pursuits. While a number of possible tangents emerge from the preceding narrative, I draw attention to the expressive elements of my grandfather's performances, which were specific musical attributes of his culture. His moans and out of tune inflections were among the many characteristics of musical expression that directly signal an African or African American cultural influence. A number of scholars have helped to identify and codify elements and sound phenomena which are specific to African American musical traditions. Samuel Floyd in The Power of Black Music lists, quote, the elements that we have come to know as the foundational elements of African American music. Calls, cries, hollers, call and response devices, additive rhythms and polyrhythms, heterophony, pendulum thirds, blue notes, bent notes and elisions, interjections and punctuations, offbeat melodic phrasing, and constant repetition of rhythmic and monot I'm sorry, melodic figures. End quote. Ollie Wilson, an African American composer, goes a step further by proposing an approach to define black musical traditions. To quote Wilson, he says, Quote, the substance of that approach is that the essence of black musical tradition consists of shared conceptual approaches to music making, and hence is basically not quantitative, but qualitative, end quote. Essentially, what Ali Wilson is saying, it ain't what you do, it's how you do it. He continues to explain that particular forms of black music are realizations of a conceptual framework that reflects the black experience, and the manifestations of that framework are infinite. Along with the sonic emblems mentioned above, genres and idioms and styles that have indelible <clears throat> connections to African American vernacular culture also come to bear on this framework. Thus, jazz, blues, gospel, and spirituals are also fodder for manipulation and innovation. Of particular pertinence to my discussion today is the spiritual. <coughs> Harry T. Burley was a respected singer who enjoyed some success as a composer at the turn of the 20th century. Among his early choral arrangements of spirituals and solo art songs, they date back to 1901. His arrangement of Deep River from 1916 drew much acclaim and marked the beginning of a new genre, the solo art song spiritual. What made this and other Burley arrangements from this era so special, according to Ollie Wilson, was Burley's ability to, quote, retain the powerful expressive essence of the spiritual and simultaneously create a piano accompaniment that complemented the song and singer without detracting from the spiritual's internal logic or poetic content, end quote. These, crea these created settings that, quote, manifested the aesthetic values of the spiritual tradition but reinterpreted the musical event with conventions associated with the Western concert stage, end quote. Generations of composers followed, and each chose various ways to reinterpret the spiritual. From choral arrangements to large orchestral works, the spiritual has been explored by composers such as Robert Nathaniel Deck, William Dawson, Lawrence Price, Zenobia Powell Perry, and Moses Hogan. The choral tradition is quite rich and is included in a number of choral literature classes across in, in departments across the country. 
therefore, my intention today is to explore realizations of the spiritual that uh, reside outside of the more conventional choral context. Specifically, I want to focus on manifestations of the spiritual in orchestral, piano, and chamber works by African American composers. The idea of the spiritual will be treated broadly at times as issues surrounding revision and reinterpretation intersect with ideas that may relate to spiritual matters, such as Sunday morning, worship practices, visions, etc. My interpretive frame will engage ideas related to memory, homage, and transcendence. Time will not permit a thorough unpacking of all of these, and I'm honestly still wrestling with a few of them, but I hope my discussions of pieces uh, will offer some insight into these notions and their relationships to music by African American composers. Uh-oh, wrong one. In addition to being one of the more well-known choral composers or choral arrangers of spirituals, William Dawson's name is also often mentioned in the context of African-American composers that were active during the Harlem Renaissance. Along with William Grant Steele and Florence Price, Dawson was considered a major musical figure. Utilizing materials from vernacular culture, each of these composers created large works for symphony orchestras that premiered before 1935. Dawson's Negro Folk Symphony, although appearing after the Steele and Price symphonies, was met with critical acclaim. Of the symphonies by these composers, Dawson's is the only one that utilizes pre-existing spiritual melodies. Whereas Steele and Price sought to capture the ethos of the spiritual <clears throat> through melodies of their own imaginations, Dawson chose to quote from the source material, therefore expanding the reach of such religious songs from the ring shops to the concert hall. His reference toward the religious folk songs of African Americans is demonstrated in his essay from 1955 entitled, Interpretations of the Religious Folk Songs of the American Negro. Although this essay appears to be, you know, it's, it's about 20 years uh, after the premiere of the Negro Folk Symphony, one might assume that his impassioned positions about performance practice, cultural memory, and interpretation developed from a long-standing involvement with religious folk songs. The deep and intricate explanations in the essay reveal not only an appreciation for the genre, but also a keen awareness of aesthetics, or perhaps values, inherent within performance and performance practices. Gwen Brown, a noted Dawson scholar who happens to be visiting with us this weekend, suggests in one of her most recent writings on Dawson that a thorough reading of the symphony should include formal analysis of Western structures and techniques uh, as well as investigations of Dawson's handling of rhythm and timbre, or sound quality. Parameters that are often look, overlooked in many musical analyses. The point here about rhythm is that Dawson spends a pretty good amount of time talking about rhythm in that 1955 essay. And so it's safe to say that his rhythmic drive or his, his, his detail to rhythm would come to bear in a symphonic composition as well. Let's listen to a clip of the third movement of the Negro Folk Symphony.
to cut that. Oh well. <clears throat> we'll move on to Zenobia Power Perry, who's a Tuskegee alum. The piece, <clears throat> homage to William Dawson, or William Lee Dawson, was written at the request of the Tuskegee Alumni Association uh, in honor of, uh, to honor his uh, life. Zenobia Power Perry taught at Central State for over 30 years and composed a number of pieces for various media. With regard to Powell, Dawson, and the spiritual, she received a healthy dose of the style and was exposed to the popular now standards arrangements of Dawson while she was a student at Tuskegee. This exposure is probably the impetus for this piece and was perhaps fodder for her rich explorations of the possibility of thematic development. And here's a little anecdote about this piece. Zenobia Power Perry is uh, noted as saying that <clears throat> I've been viewed and I've been scorned as one of Dawson's favorite spirituals. So much so that he asked her to create a four measure accompaniment when she was but a sophomore uh, during her time um, to prepare for one of the radio broadcasts. So according to Zenobia Pau Perry, this isn't me, but according to Zenobia Pau Perry, she was walking to the dining hall one day and uh, Dawson stopped her, started talking to her, but he didn't stop moving the car. So he passed by her and he was still into this explanation of how he wanted this trumpet or horn-like introduction to sound. So he started to back up. He didn't stop talking. And the car didn't stop moving. And so eventually he ended up running his car into a ditch. And of course, this brought much uh, laughter from the student body uh, to see Mr. Dawson drive his car into a ditch. Uh, and so those, that anecdote actually comes from the liner notes of the Zenobia Powell Perry CD. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty, pretty interesting thing to, to, to know that Mr. Dawson drove his car into a ditch talking about music with one of his students. That just shows some dedication there. Uh, this, the piece is through composed and it's based on the spiritual I've been buked and I've been scorned. The trouble all over this world motive appears a lot throughout the piece and I don't know if we'll get to that point uh, in this particular clip. But you can definitely hear some, uh, uh, some, some connections uh, between the Dawson and the Perry treatments of spiritual things. At least I hope you will. Gonna basically now it's gonna kind of take a, a, a really show and tell. I want to introduce as many different composers uh, as I can in this short period of time, uh, and it's really gonna feel a lot like a, a lecture with a lot of information. But if you have any questions, feel free to see me. I'll let you know about recordings of any of these composers. Please, please, please. This is my passion, so forgive me for going through a lot of pieces in, uh, in one talk. This piece, John Work. Scuppermont, three pieces for country folk. It's a solo piano and the clip that I'll be playing is at a certain church. This piece is interesting for a couple of reasons. 
the piece that is quoted in the piece, uh, uh, the, the, or I should say the spiritual song that is quoted in the piece is not an actual Negro spiritual. It's actually a, a hymn, I am bound for the promised land, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand, and so on. But what makes the setting really interesting is that uh, the composer's after uh, imagery. At the beginning of the piece, you're gonna hear bells tolling, church bells, <coughs> probably. And then you're gonna hear a particular setting of this hymn, I've been bound for the promised land. What makes this setting interesting is that it is not like a hymnal setting. All of the voices, the soprano, alto, and tenor at least, are moving in the same direction. Just like a gospel choir would. You know, everybody has tenors go up and everybody's you know, everybody's moving in the same direction. But in the alto voice, I don't know why it's the altos, but the alto gets a little happy and starts to move around just a little bit inside this texture. What's significant about that in this particular setting is that with, uh, everyone has an opportunity to participate on Sunday morning. And even within what might appear to be a disparate showing of, of musical lines, actually it creates a very unified sense of, uh, a unified sense of wholeness. Okay, so listen for that middle voice in the alto line. Church bell. Did you hear how busy that alto was? And eh, it's all, it just happened along with thing. But she was still in the, she was still in order. She was still in order. All right. Let's move to Ollie Wilson. Oh wait. We got order there. A Visions and Truth, song cycle for trio and chamber ensemble, was composed in 1989 uh, on commission for the Center for Black Music Research. Of Wilson's work that actively engaged black vernacular emblems, the spiritual was the musical source that is most often employed. For Wilson, the spiritual is, quote, the earliest and most profound music I ever experienced, end quote. Whereas he recalls childhood experiences with his father singing spirituals with church and community choirs in a number of interviews, the genre became even more meaningful to him as he aged. Quote, as I got older and learned more about the history of the spiritual and what it really meant, it became very, very powerful. Uh, source for musical ideas for me. The older I get, it seems so natural to me because it reflects something very solid. So that reservoir of sensibilities, sensitivities, and also as a reservoir of cultural traits, of cultural ideas of African American music, which really informs to a great degree of what I do, becomes central to me as a creative artist." End quote. Beginning in the mid-1970s and continuing into the 21st century, the spiritual has been a primary source an inspiration for many of Wilson's works. For example, his spirit song, composed in 1974, attempts to explore in one composition of historical development of the African American spiritual, the transition from the re religious wordless moans to the historical moment when English text was associated with these vocal utterances. Sometimes, for tenor and tape, or electronic tape, was composed in 1976 and was dedicated to his parents who, quote, taught him how to sing. This profound piece uh, not only expresses the human hopelessness and desolation that characterizes the traditional spiritual, but simultaneously and on another level uh, demonstrates a pretty volatile reaction to that desolation that transcends hopelessness. In addition, the second movement of A City Called Heaven seeks to evoke the character of the sensibilities of, of the original spiritual in a new musical context. For Wilson, these new musical contexts are quite modern. 
you've heard of Schoenberg or Weber or some of those modern composers that use the atonality, 12-tone rows, and things that just don't quite sound that good to the ear. Uh, to set a spiritual in that setting is quite profound. Wilson's setting uh, in this particular piece really harkens back to the Hall Johnson arrangement from 1946 of I've Been Viewed. Considering Wilson's childhood recollections of his father's and family's engagement with, uh, with the spiritual, it's reasonable to assume that he heard this particular one when he was a child. powerful piece. I offer a little note, additional note, on of visions and truth. These are Olive Wilson's note about the piece, the larger piece. A visions and truth is based on my personal reflection of the historical status of African American males in American society. In a broad sense, the composition considers the optimistic vision of, a, of an egalitarian America while simultaneously acknowledging the harsh, colossal hypocrisy of the historical truth that is a mockery of that ideal. He continues by stating that the first movement, which we just heard a little bit of, I've been viewed, is, quote, a reinterpretation of the African-American spiritual, which reflects the sensibilities of the slave being maltreated, but more important, the belief that he will transcend this fate. One interesting thing about this is that this is the first movement of it. The piece actually ends with the setting of If We Must Die, a poem by Claude McKay. Let's listen to the, that, the final measures of, of I've Been Beat. And that was the last setting of the verse, and go on and lay my vision down. The new black music repertory ensemble recorded five movements in color in 2009 as part of the first volume of the recorded music of the African diaspora series. I had the pleasure of meeting the composer Mary Watkins during the recording sessions. Realizing the importance of the moment, I asked for an impromptu interview during lunch. I happened to have a recording device handy at the time. Our discussion centered on inspiration and elements in the composition that were distinctively black. I told her that upon my first hearing of the piece, I identified vernacular elements in three of the five movements and continued to explain what I heard. She nodded affirmatively as if I hit the nail on the head. 
I then continued and asked about the second and fifth movements, where the emblems were not as apparent. Regarding the second movement, Soul of Remembrance, and while gathering her thoughts, she said the melody was pentatonic, that is a five note melody, and was reminiscent of what she heard in church. Immediately following her statement about the church, she said, quote, that song, Remember Me. Remember me? Remember me. I, 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 that's all right. I ain't going to ask all right. I just want to make sure, you, uh, make sure I was in the right spot. All right. Uh, so, Remember Me. Well, it kind of starts out that way. This is Mary Watkins talking. So I think the feeling is, I guess you can say African-American. I've always mixed elements of European and African, the essence of the two. And for me, that worked perfectly for the soul of humanity, really. But I saw my people in their long march to fully express themselves as fully human, you know, in a society where we were always boxed in by this or that. You know, it's like the divine elements in a soul. And I was particularly thinking about my people, but I also think of everyone. This sentiment resonates throughout the movement, as the slow and pensive movement is neither dirge-like nor melancholy. It's indeed hopeful and optimistic. Watkins' lyrical song opens with a sober melody along with a faintly pulsating harp and plucked bass piccicato accompaniment. And so that, plucked, that plucked bass is kind of like that march. You kind of hear doom, 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 doom. And then this melody reminiscent of Remember Me will start to soar over that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut that one either. Um, Frederick Tillis, Spiritual Fantasy Number no. 12, written in 1988 as the work of string quartet based on Wade in the Water. I first came across the music of Dr. Frederick Tillis when I worked on a project involved, involving music composed during the Civil Rights Movement. He wrote a very powerful choral piece in 1968 entitled Freedom, which reflects his personal feelings after learning of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Aside from his international reputation as a concert music composer, he's also a well-respected jazz saxophonist. Um, in 1980, he began a set of works called Spiritual Fantasies. To date, there are 30 complete fantasies, um, and he wants to compose at least 32. All of them use African, uh, the African-American spiritual in some form or another. Some of the references are quite literal, others are more abstract. He said that he started the series because he, quote, wanted to keep the spiritual tradition alive, end quote. Tillis completed Spiritual Fantasy Number no. 12 for String Quartet in 1988. It is believed that the premiere recording by the Lark String Quartet in 1996 was produced from a revised version completed in 1995. I make this note because the liner notes of the recording give 1995 as the date of completion, but earlier scores held by the composer and that are also housed at the Center for Black Music Research cite 1988 as the copyright date. Each of the four movements in the string quartet 
Uh, uses titles from unknown uh, spirituals, nobody knows the trouble I see, wait in the water, I'm a rolling, etc. Each movement is named for the source of its thematic and material. What's interesting about this piece is that um, I think jazz actually worked backward with this because Tillis recorded in a single take a version of Motherless Child in 1989. So Motherless Child must have been on his mind at some point. And so then after or somewhere a little bit before that, um, some elements from the string quartet pop up in, in his improvisations and vice versa in this 1995 version. Let's listen to Tillis' saxophone version and then we'll move directly into the string quartet. Now the string quartet. String quartet. So you can definitely hear some of the jazz influences in that. You can definitely hear the weight in the water motive and, and how all of these worlds are just con colliding in this string quartet thing. You know, when, of all the places for the type of stuff to collide, a string quartet. So yet another level of, of, of signification and involvement uh, with this, uh, this Western and, and, and African-American vernacular thing. So here we have a jazz saxophonist improvising on Motherless Child and then the improvisations from Motherless Child find its way into a string quartet based on Wade in the Water. Uh, yeah, kind of rich, kind of rich, very rich. Uh, I think I'm gonna move a little faster, is that okay? And I'm gonna flip the script just a little bit. That was Simpson's paraphrase. What makes this piece interesting is that Ralph Simpson was a uh, is a composer and taught at Tennessee State University. He composed this piece because a student of his hated the counterpoint. So uh, in order to show her uh, the, the viability of counterpoint or music that was in the style of J.S. Bach, he composed this piece for her just for her senior recital. And so it just kind of, it's a testament to the, to the personalized learning experiences 
uh, that can happen uh, at historically black colleges. I don't know too many folks who would take a spiritual and set it against Bach just to make sure that a student understands how the spiritual works and how it can be viable. So I think it's a very powerful piece that way. And um, also the piece has been performed many times uh, as a tribute to, to uh, Dr. Sampson uh, at that school. And of course it's been recorded uh, now and, and it's, it's with us for a long time. But this also exists uh, in an organ arrangement as well. Um, <clears throat> the other piece that I'd like to, to bring to your attention as we flip the script, and this is classicisms that interact with vernacular forms. Okay, well, of course, we have the spiritual interacting with something that sounded just like Bach, counterpoint. Okay, that's one thing. This one is a little more rich. This is V. Michael McKay's Behind the Curtain. Uh, v. Michael McKay uh, is known for uh, his compositions that uh, Yolanda Adams sings. Uh, but he's also a gifted songwriter whose work primarily comes out of the gospel music workshop of America. What you will hear in this particular clip is the soloist use a very operatic tone. Why this moment signifies, or why this, what makes this particular performance powerful is that as you look at the lyrics, all of the lyrics except for the last statement of the third verse speak to what she's looking at, or it speaks to a distance, right? A house, a seat, a reservation, a ticket stamp with blood, a king, a crown, a robe, a throne, a scene never seen before. A gathering at the river, a shadow of immortality, a sinner healed, a proud seraphim, a moment waiting for me. And I want you to listen to what happens to this soloist when she gets to the moment waiting for her. Something that's it's going, it's, you know, tad wide open. Okay? <coughs> She's starting to lose it. I gotta check that one out. That's rich, that's rich. I mean, aside from the moment preaching in and of itself, what makes it powerful and significant is this critical distance that this operatic soprano voice is having as she's looking at all these things. But then when she realizes it's at that moment when it's for her, the operatic tone has to go away and she has to be a little more personal with that thing. And so that, that's another level of signification. It, it's, it's, a, it's a timbral thing, it's a sound quality thing. There's a, uh, the, the piece was, I think, it's, uh, I think it was originally supposed to be an opera or an operetta in three acts. So he was moving in that direction. I don't believe the piece has been completed just yet. Uh, but this was recorded on the Gospel Music Workshop of America album. And so when you, you have this operatic soprano making these statements, and then, but, but even there, that, that, that uh, uh, I'll go ahead and say it, uh, when you are using that Western operatic tone, there's a distance there. 
There's a critical distance from the score. There's a critical distance from a lot of things, a lot of the musical things. But right at the moment, and, and, and you can hear it in the third verse, when she says a gathering at the river, she, you know, right? She, she almost lost it at the river, but she pulled it together at the river moment. But when she got to the point of where it was saying, a moment waiting for me, score went away, melismas, runs, whatever you want to call them, replaced all of that. And it became a personal statement and a personal testimony to not only a, a, a profound musical thing, but also probably a personal statement about her own personal relationship. And I'll leave that right there. Um, no show and tell moment of classicism and gospel will be complete without mentioning Dr. Pearl Williams' arrangement of Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Richard Smallwood, a leading figure in contemporary gospel, heard Dr. Williams' arrangement when he was younger and was moved to offer his own arrangement or revision as a testament and tribute to her uh, in his recording entitled Testimony. There's a rich discourse in this piece as well that uh, evokes uh, Johann Sebastian Bach again, who just happened to be a church musician, so it's probably not a mistake that some of his settings fit so well with spirituals and, 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 and gospelized things. He, he was a, a minister of music, so to speak. But what you'll hear is yes, the joy of man's desire set against Jesus' lover of the soul. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. The Smallwood arrangement does not veer far from the melody with regard to contour, but the vernacular influence 
is directly felt in the rhythm and the arrangement of the voices. And this layering of vernacular rhythmic treatment on top of the steady, persistent, triple compound accompaniment of the Bach creates moments of rhythmic density and tension that, 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 that speak in, in various ways. To conclude, I'd like to end with Samuel Floyd's definition of musical signifying. He defines it as the rhetorical use of pre-existing materials as a means of demonstrating respect for or poking fun at a musical style process or practice through parody, pastiche, implication, indirection, humor, tone play, or wordplay, the illusion of speech or narration or other tripping mechanisms, end quote. Indeed, the Williams and Smallwood uh, signify on Bach and Wesley's work, but neither Williams's nor Smallwood's signifying posture suggests humor or poking fun. Smallwood definitely transforms the pre-existing hymn by adding vernacular nuances that trifle and tease with the rhythmic and pitch schemes of the original hymn and the Bach piece. Indeed, all of these works to some degree signify on some level. If we think back to the Mary Watkins signifying on Remember Me by indirect quotation. The paraphrase, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder, Johann Sebastian Bach, Ollie Wilson, is an Obia Kyle Perry, signifying on I've been viewed. Oh, let me shine from the Dawson third movement. I think that's, it. oh, Frederick Tillis, motherless child, and wait in the water. Signifying, to be sure, no fun, no poking, no play, but a strong demonstrable respect from the traditions they come. I'd like to also note that each of these composers, some I didn't get to because of time, all have connections to historical black colleges, except for B. Michael McKay. I'm not quite sure about him. Dawson, Perry, Tuskegee, Mary Watkins, Howard, Richard Smallwood, Howard, Ralph Simpson, Tennessee State University, Ollie Wilson, Taught in Florida at Anna. Who am I missing? Frederick Tillis attended Wiley College as an undergraduate. Taught at Grambling, Wiley, and Kentucky State before going on to the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So rich traditions, rich legacies reside in historically black colleges and universities. Beside the quick survey of pieces in a relatively short period of time. I hope to have demonstrated two things. One, the wide range of expressive revisions that African American composers have taken with spirituals and spiritual songs. And two, the viability of an expanded view of the spiritual in our readings, interpretations, and perhaps performances of works by African American composers. Various features of the works mentioned today bring some facets of the spiritual to mind, but the composer's compelling play with quotation and inference in these works provide fertile ground for continued studies on the rich intersection between spiritual, cultural, and social topics as they apply to African American composers and the works they produce. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maxwell. It's just, wow. <laughs> I wish we had more time to, to, to hear more of what you have. Uh, we open the floor now for some questions. And hopefully you have them just bubbling over. Uh, wow, we've, we've been taken to the end of the world and back uh, in this short amount of time. But is, is there any question, question? Okay, we'll wait. Well, I do want to, uh, while they're thinking, uh, you mentioned that there's a, uh, an author among us, uh, Dr. Brown. Yes, if you would. Uh, writer on, uh, doc, on Dr. William Levi Dawson and uh, working on another book by him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, all righty then. 
That means I covered it. Yes. Um, the, the, sh the short answer is um, yes, uh, but it's, it's not a definitive yes, it's not a concrete yes. Um, a little sh a brief history, uh, basically all of your African American composers were active at historically black colleges until 1968, 69, around the death of Martin Luther King. And when that happened, there was a large advent of black studies departments that started springing up at majority institutions. And so at that point, because of, of, of additional resources or, or other things like that, composers started to leave. Uh, Wendell Logan, uh, Ollie Wilson were both at Florida A&M. Uh, uh, Wendell Logan ended up at Oberlin. Ollie Wilson ended up at California Berkeley. Uh, and actually, both of them ended up, uh, uh, there's a, I think there's a jazz studies wing built in Linda Logan's honor at Oberlin now. Uh, and uh, Ollie Wilson uh, uh, ended his career as chair of the music department at Cal Berkeley. Uh, around that time, Frederick Tillis leaves Kentucky State and ends up at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, and he ends up uh, heading the fine arts department and builds this multi-million dollar, get, gets funding for this multi-million dollar facility. Uh, T.J. Anderson, Thomas Jefferson Anderson, mm, was at Morehouse uh, before he took a job at uh, Tufts. Uh, and he re ended up retiring at Tufts and, and had lots of collaborative work. So all that to say uh, that, uh, that the tradition has, has always been there for creativity. Uh, from the standpoint of classical music uh, in this way, it's, it's kind of hard for composers to develop when audiences aren't being developed. Uh, and so if it's hard for American composers like uh, Copeland or, uh, give me another, Copeland came to mind. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. Uh, uh, Copeland, I mean, we'll just even say Stravinsky as an American composer. Uh, if it's a hard time for them to have their works performed by major symphony orchestras, uh, just imagine the, the level of, of politics that it would take for uh, a composer of color in the United States to have their works performed. So you have those types of barriers. But there are opportunities, or there have been opportunities historically. There was a uh, competition in Detroit uh, a couple of years ago where af young African-American composers were invited to submit works for their works to be read by symphony orchestras. There, there was also a competition in Atlanta in the 90s where uh, there were some older composers who actually shepherded young composers in a, in a black composer thing. So there are pockets of activity happening. Uh, uh, there's one unique gentleman who's actually a co composition teacher up in New Jersey who actually was taught by only African-American Composers. I think he's the only person in the United States that has that uh, that 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 uh, that pedigree. Uh, yeah, his name is Trevor 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 Weston, and he's a department chair. Uh, so yes, there there are opportunities out there, but when it comes time for getting your works performed, sometimes you have to find contemporary music ensembles that can deal with the with the, the intricate rhythmic pieces like that. Um, so wherever there's good teaching, there's always going to be good room for development, and you just have to kind of push. Um, the, uh, the technology today <coughs> makes composition a little bit easier because you can hear your works a little faster with, with Sibelius and, and Finale and things like that, but it doesn't take away from the, the practice of craft, and I think the practice of craft <coughs> is what uh, is, it, uh, occurs from the interaction between student and teacher. And those happen at, at all institutions as long as the institutions are, are careful and care enough to do that. Um, I am thinking of a few younger 
African American composers. One is at Wheaton College right now. Uh, Charles Tanner is on faculty at Morehouse right now as a theory teacher. He's also a composer. Um, and, and, and the list goes on and on. So yes, there, 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 there is activity today, but we kind of have to create opportunities for these works to be heard. Yes, ma'am. Sunday morning, Amen. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and a great one for all choirs and I think schools. Uh, yeah. I do not. I do not. I would I would stretch to say that Donald Lawrence had his hand at least in the arrangement. Uh, because the, the segment approach to those various segments, you know, you have the, the, the funky dun dun and then you have the, you know, so that segmented uh, approach is is very uh, uh, common to what Donald Lawrence was up to before he became Donald Lawrence. Uh, he was, he, uh, a lot of his stuff but from the late 80s and early 90s has that kind of segmented approach. So I would stress to say, it, if not, definitely in the production, uh, on the production end, Donald Lawrence is going to produce Donald Lawrence. So I know his name is there for producer, at least co-producer. Uh, but on the writer side, I don't know. But I do know, I'm pretty, I'm almost pretty sure that he had his hand in the arrangements. Yes. Well, when I when I say audience development, I'm speaking in a global American kind of thing, not just a black audience for a black composer or a white audience for a white composer. Uh, the idea of classical music uh, in the in the United States is is one associated with genteel life uh, that might be uh, that might attract folks that. Uh, have money or, or classical music is a, that is a, comes from a place of privilege and power and things like that. So uh, if, if you're trying to debunk any of those myths or classifications with that music, you might make a conscious effort to not like it, even though some of the music might make a lot of sense. Um, so when I say develop uh, through music appreciation classes, uh, through uh, continued um, support and encouragement for musicians to play, whether they're music majors or not. Because when you, when you play in an ensemble, uh, when you sing in an ensemble, there's an appreciation there for music that stretches beyond. So you don't have to be a music major in order to love this. But if you just, if you participate in music, that means that you are uh, a benefactor your stakeholder in this. And so, uh, just as we would patronize any singer, dancer, songwriter that makes his or her way to town, if by chance there's a concert in the area and you happen to see a name that you don't recognize, look up that name. It just might be an African American composer, uh, particularly with symphony orchestras or something like that. So if you see a symphony orchestra program and you see Berlioz, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, and Scott, you might want to look up Scott, because that Scott might be Daryl Scott out of, out of New York. Or if you see Smith, that might be Hale Smith, African-American composer of note uh, who died a few years ago out of New York. You might see Steele, William Grant Steele. You might see um, Watkins, Mary Watkins. So when there are names that you don't recognize, those are the opportunities that we would take to go to attend these concerts or just not African-American composers, but American composers in general. Because it, you, you're just a stretch for, for any symphony series to hear Aaron Copeland, Stravinsky, or any other American piece as you would to hear an African-American piece. So when, when you don't recognize names, those are the concerts to go to. And sometimes the sounds aren't all that agreeable. Something, it's not gonna be melodious all the time. But that doesn't mean that it's not music and that it's not good. It just means that that's a different composer's way of expressing themselves. It's the difference between Nas and LL Cool J. Y'all know what I'm talking about over there. 
Same message, different means, right? Different generations. I'm an LL Cool J. I stopped listening. Well, you know what? I'll talk to y'all about that later. Um, but yeah, yeah. But it's it's same same message, different 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 methods. Yes, ma'am. Uh, again, I had, I had the pleasure of meeting him. Uh, he's a modern composer, lots of percussion in Alvin Singleton's pieces. So if you're a percussionist, you have a lot of work to do with, with, with Alvin Singleton. Uh, but he's, and Alvin Singleton is one of those rare composers that, that uh, don't, don't have a, a, an institutional affiliation. You know, he's, and making his living composing and having this music, which is a rare thing. Most composers have institutional affiliation, so that speaks to his, his talent and, uh, and credibility as well. Yes, ma'am. Sharon Willis is also at Atlanta, and she composes a lot of opera. A lot, lot of opera? She has her own opera company. Opera company. Has she composed for organ, too? Has she composed for organ? Organ. Her name sounds familiar. Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard her name before. All right. Okay. And there's also a Houston Ebony Opera Guild. And the, so the history of, of, of African American opera guilds stretches all the way back to the 19th century. Yeah. And I think uh, Opera South out of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, did a lot of premieres as well in the, in the 1980s. Yes, ma'am. It's just a quick question. Mm -hmm. So, so are you agree with me saying that you mentioned Richard Palmer? Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what makes him so significant for the same category of things like blues and like theory, uh, or was this like you know he was just because he also had something to do with the HBCU? Oh no, basically, uh, I, I used those last three examples to basically flip the flip the flip the angle. Basically, uh, for those last three pieces, I was basically trying to show that the primary source was an African American form, where classical emblems or Western emblems were imposed upon that form. Whereas on the other end of it, it's more classical, and then we're we're throwing in the the, the African American elements. So basically, we're just flipping the flipping the dynamic of the paradigm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that a lot of your examples for like modern composers and modern pieces are from like the 80s and the 90s. Are there any more like African American composers or even just like American classical composers that are really producing more music now, like in this 20, 21st century? Oh, yes. Uh, Sean Acapello uh, is at Wheaton College and he just produced a CD. Uh, that's based on spirituals called Steal Away. Um, uh, Wheaton in Wheaton, Illinois. Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, that's the most recent project that came out. Um, William Banfield out of Berkeley. He's at Berkeley. Yeah, William Banfield is at Berkeley. I'm thinking about Jonathan Bailey Holland. Uh, Jonathan Holland. Jonathan Bailey Holland, who's also at Berkeley. Also, Boston University uh, is also doing some, some things recently, uh, some recent works. Uh, Mary Watkins, you just heard, uh, uh, just completed an opera about two years ago uh, uh, on, on, on a civil rights theme. Uh, so, then those are active, you know, those are active these days. But you got to have money to get things recorded, and then when things are recorded, they're essentially fantasy recordings because the whole idea of CD. <coughs> You know, with MP3s and all that stuff, well, that's a, I, I can preach on that all day. Um, but the whole idea of CD for the folks is not really a pain in the You know, recording for the sake of posterity. Uh, you're not going to make much money off of it. You know, most classical CDs don't, uh, unless you are, you know, one of the names and just being like break even uh, on the recording. So you really have to come up with these things. YouTube is a good place for those messages. Yes. Gibbs 
or, or receptionist, how, how, how do you kind of keep, keep things in contact without getting too, I guess, subjective? How, how do we come to appreciate them even though it's still early? You know, because of course we have a lot that we can say about a lot of these other composers because they were a while ago and a lot of people have studied them. When we're singing them today because they're still new, how would you recommend that we go about appreciating the work that they produce? Oh, keep singing it. Keep singing it. And then when you leave this place and you happen to see that thing, wherever you end up, say for example, you end up in <coughs> Detroit, and through your your professional connections, you end up being a part of a, of a music board or some kind of board or something like that, and then you have the opportunity to create a program for this particular series, you might reflect on that place on that moment and want to have that composer be a part. So even though we might not have the benefit of recording, that composer's work will still live through your involvement. So sing it with conviction. You sing, you would sing, you would approach those composers with the same conviction, the same fervor, the same zest, and the same zeal that you would approach the ninth movement of Beethoven. There's no difference. They're all numbers on the page. And it's up to you to bring them to life. So appreciation through performance practice and be diligent. If the composer writes specific instructions for you, then you do that. Uh, there's an anecdote out about Hale Smith and uh, uh, what's that uh, uh, soprano, um, Captain Mountain. Uh, Hale Smith was very meticulous in his notation, but because it was a spiritual Kathleen Mountain thought that she could take a little latitude he stopped her in the middle of the rehearsal and said, nope, I didn't write that. So where there is some, some left to the degree that you can be true to what the composer puts on the page, <coughs> he or she has taken time to do that. Piano means piano. Mezzo piano means mezzo piano. Slur means slur. Those aren't just symbols. Those aren't just habits made. This is a composer's way of communicating exactly how that, he or she wants that sound to sound at that moment. So your approach and your diligence, your preparation, and your seriousness is all the truth that that composer's going to mean because that will transfer a whole cloth in the performance experience. Guaranteed. Because a lot of times um, we've seen 
these spirituals, and they deal with kind of the slavery mm -hmm. time frame. So when it comes to Negro spirituals going forward for the future, what do you see the, the attitude or the mindset behind the Negro spirituals? Wow, that's loaded. Um, I think some of it, as far as your mind, the, the, the interpretation piece, uh, spiritual said something totally different at the beginning of the 20th century than they say it now. Yeah. Uh, so for you to sing certain arrangements that were very new in 1920, 1930, there was a sense of, of pride and accomplishment and, and all these other things that, that in, in, in the midst of all of these bad things that slavery represents, that the real and the gumption to sing is, is, is something, you know, that's something to think about. And so then for that particular melody to be recorded in some way and reinterpreted as something else. So when you think about that, when you think about the global impact of slavery, then you can think in terms of, or you might be able to think in terms of what, what might be enslaving me now, you know, and, and think about where the solace is in certain words or in certain phrases. And so not that the idea of chattel slavery, that is black folks with property, exists today, but the idea of, of uh, focus uh, or a lack of focus in certain things. So I'm focusing on things that don't necessarily matter could be a form of entrapment or something that will distract us. And so to the degree that you can take a frame of reference from a body of literature that meant so much to so many people at one time and transfer that level of meaning to your situation to be a way to just approach it. Would it be new, would it be new Negro spirituals? I have no clue. The text would be totally different. The text might be, might come out might come out of some underground hip hop text, you know, as far as themes and language <coughs> that is recurrent that, that is current to this day. Uh, but the idea of the spirit and the purpose of the spiritual, I think, transcends time. Or era, I should say, era. Not time, era. Yes, sir. Might it be also that as we look today, we've seen all of this problem with police and the, the black youth. You know, could, that, could that be a part of what yeah. the music can go? Right, right. I mean, we'll. Will the will the will the glory soundtrack function the way that spirituals function back then? You know, that, that's something to think about. Because that, because now we now we think about function. You know, who's hearing this? You know, when the um, uh, singers, Jubilee singers were going around promoting this music, they weren't really singing to black audiences because black folks couldn't go to concert halls. So what was that money to support this coming from? La, yeah, that's rich right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you have to think about the form and function of the music and what it meant at that time. You know, are spirituals relevant today? Absolutely, absolutely. But how are they relevant? Is is a different question. It's a different question. Or how do we make them relevant?
<laughs> and uh, so once again, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, please remember this evening at 7 p.m. over in Logan Hall, our William Levi Nelson concert. Uh, we have this thing with us, uh, Clapton University, of the State University, and FAMU, Florida A&M University. Uh, of course, our own alumni choir and our concert band will be with us as well. So thank you so much. Happy.